the world there are two kinds of people there are some people are wise and some are otherwise so wise and otherwise and the curious thing is that it is not just that people are otherwise but actually each one of us we tend to oscillate between being wise and otherwise that we sometimes end up focusing on act, we act in sometimes ways which are very wise especially when we are giving advice to others we may surprise ourselves with our wisdom the kind of drops of wisdom coming from us but there are other times the there are other times when we may when we may actually act in ways that afterwards is unrecognizable who am i who is this person who spoke like that acted like that so we oscillate between being wise and being otherwise and there are times when we may feel as if there are almost like two people inside us it's almost as if if we consider our own person our own the way we function if there is the self but the self oscillates sometimes the self is wise sometimes it's otherwise i had a vivid realization or experience of this where in my teens at that time i was studying engineering 25 years ago and at that time i was in a lab and suddenly a friend called out to me hey there's wildlife on your body i look up and he just raised his hand to smack a small insect that was crawling on my shirt I said i don't hurt it and i just touched it on my finger let it come on my finger crawl onto my finger and i gently lowered it on the ground and it went away and my friend looked at me with bemused eyes i remember his wide eyes had opened a few hours later we were uh, in our hostel mess well mess is a place that is messy because we take food over there so it was and we were talking and he suddenly spoke something which enraged me and he had, he had done something which he had hidden from me so to some extent my anger was justified but at that time i just rose up raised my fist and said i will kill you as i raised my hand i spoke those words again his eyes opened wide and it's almost as if i froze as i looked at his eyes because i remembered hey those eyes had opened wide just a few hours ago and it was almost as if i had an out of body experience where i was looking at myself from above hey, wait a minute who is this person just a few hours ago this person was not ready to let even an ant be hurt and now this person is saying that i'll kill you to my best friend so who is the real me and that has started me on a path of search so i was always a avid reader of books but from that time i started reading more books on psychology and philosophy psychology because i wanted to understand what what is inside me what is the what is going on and in philosophy because i felt that that could give me a not just a psychological understanding but a more of understanding of reality from a holistic perspective and a few years later i encountered the bhagavad gita so <clears throat> the experience that we are sometimes wise and sometimes otherwise that is something which is very common so we could say when we are wise our inner power works for us for us means it it increases our power and we are our functioning gets improved but whatever something is inside us when we are otherwise that inner power seems to be working against us and then our functionality almost becomes depleted so even ordinary things that we are normally very easily able to do we find it difficult to do so for example there if we consider let's consider 
three broad mental health problems, which we will be addressing elaborately in the course. We consider depression. Now, in depression, there could be definitely uh, social causes for depression. Many things could have gone wrong in our life. There could be neurological causes for depression. Certain enzymes could be low. Ultimately, however, beyond all these factors, what is happening is if this is the self and then there is energy coming out from the self, but there is something inside us that is that seems to be blocking that energy for come come. So because of that, the energy that eventually comes out is might be just a trickle. So when a person is depressed, it is characterized by the unwillingness to even do anything. Why even get out of bed? Why even do anything at all? So there is something inside us that seems to de-energize us. And I've talked with friends who have had depression. I fortunately have not had very acute incidents of depression. Where, but you know, it's like they know that there are many important things to do. I want to do them, but I just don't feel any energy for it. And it's not that they're physically exhausted, just mentally exhausted. If there's nothing physically seriously wrong with them. So there is something inside us which seems to work against us. Now that something is known by different names, but one common name for this something is the mind. Or as in much yoga tradition, it is specifically called as the monkey mind. The mind is like a monkey keeps being restless. A monkey can be a nuisance. So like that this mind can be a nuisance. So something inside us works against us. And depression can be a very serious problem if it stays on for a long time. It just prevents us from functioning. If we go further, let's consider addiction. Now, when we say somebody is an addict, you know, sometimes we, we may think that this person is, you know that the substance that you're abusing, be it alcohol or uh, cigarettes or drugs, they know that those things are harmful to them. It's not that they don't know, but somehow they just can't resist it. Now, it is easy to see the addicts as demented. You're just being a fool. But actually, it's not that simple. They're not just demented. They are tormented. Tormented means what? Even when they know this is going to harm me. Maybe initially they don't know. But over a period of time, unless a person is in severe denial, they know. But what seems to happen over there is, again, the same thing. The self is here. And say there is this substance whatever it is, it could be alcohol. This is the self. This is the addictive substance. Now, there seems to be something within us, some part of us, which seems to be forcefully dragging it towards us. We need to have it. Although there might be another part of us which say, you know, Keep this away. Keep this away. Create a bridge, create a create a blockage between this. Let's not go toward that. Let's block it. But that just doesn't seem to work. So there is something which is tormenting us. Do it, do it, do it. And then the same, same thing seems to torment us in another way afterwards. It's, suppose say we are living a nice uh, law-abiding, responsible life and a friend comes and tells us, Hey, you know, I have got a scheme to make money very quickly. Okay, what is that? So let's go and rob a bank. Say, what? Nonsense, I'm not going to do it. No, no, I have a foolproof scheme. We can go and rob the bank and we'll get away. No, no. Somehow this friend is very aggressive and persuasive and we reluctantly go along. And then when we are in the bank, we're about to rob it. At that time, alarm rings. And the security comes rushing in with guns. And this friend leaves us in the lurch and runs. We are caught for something which we first of all didn't even want to do. 
and then on top of that when we are, we are arrested and we are taken to the court and we see there sitting as the judge the same friend hey outrageous it is you got me to rob and now you are going to judge me and punish me for robbing our mind this thing inside us this is what it does to us if you consider this is the self then there is this thing called the mind what it does is it first pulls us to do self destructive things self destructive things and one okay i'll just move this up it pulls us to do self destructive things and then after that that same thing seems to lambast us for doing those things you fool why did you do that so we may overeat the mind says eat little more little more little more little more and then after we overeat you fool when will you learn how many times will you be you be like a glutton sometimes we plan to wake up in the morning and we set the alarm for a particular time and then the snooze button is often the most overused button in the alarm and we switch it off and maybe wake up a half an hour later one hour later two hours later the same mind in me same mind which says sleep a little bit sleep a little bit sleep a little bit and then when we finally wake up of two hours our whole day schedule is disrupted that same mind stands in judgment you fool how lazy are you going to be when are you going to learn so this deadly double role completely entraps us first it befools us into doing something wrong and then it berates us for doing that wrong so this mind this two parts of its role could put it that it befools and it berates makes us do wrong and then chides us for doing wrong chastises us for doing wrong so this is deadly and this way essentially what happens is that we end up entrapped by the mind so addiction is where we are on the path of self defeat or self destruction and perhaps the most dangerous of the aspects of the mind's troubles is suicide while well, suicide is a tragic phenomena and it can have many specific and complex causes essentially suicide is basically the mind killing the body when sociologists say that suicide is it is the triumph of despair over hope it is there are things wrong in everyone's life there are things right in everyone's life. but when this thing inside us fixates on the negative part on the destructive part on all that is wrong in our life we start feeling desperate so tapping the power of the mind is no is no casual not a matter of casual curiosity it can be a matter of survival necessity right it can be a question even of our mind we learning how to stop the mind from destroying our life and of course i don't want to portray only a dark picture of the mind we we all have experience sometimes when we are what in today's popular language is called as in the zone there are different words for it in the zone peak performance in form at that time we are so focused on something that everything seems to fall in place the same distractions you no know, we are doing something and the same distractions you normally distract us we don't even notice them we may forget food we may forget sleep just get absorbed in something so these are the times when the mind works with us and when this happens these are the times when some of our best performance comes out and it's not just external performance that is impressive with these times but it's also internal fulfillment that comes with it. both of these come 
when we are in the zone that when the mind works for us we are able to both achieve something substantial the work that may take otherwise 10 hours that may drag on for 10 hours just complete in one two hours immersed in it and we feel enriched sharp is a great time so this is the positive aspect of the power of the mind and the mind is capable of a lot and later on in the session itself i'll talk about the difference between the mind and the brain but the idea is that the mind's power if it can be tapped we all can be can on both do better do far better and not just in terms of actions but we can be better so among all the things that we can learn in our life we can learn engineering we can learn software we can learn for a new language we can learn we can learn driving we can learn airplane try airplane we can become a pilot so many things we could learn but probably the most important thing we can learn is learn to tap the power of the mind mind management is probably the most important skill that we all can learn so this is the first part i talked about why is it important to tap the power of the mind now i'll talk about how is the bhagavad gita relevant for it so the gita as it is called in short is a uh, is seen in many different ways it is seen by some as a classical yoga text especially in the yoga world patanjali yoga sutra and bhagavad gita are considered the foundational yoga texts some people see it as a philosophical classic emerson thoreau is prominent american thinkers they have appreciated it that they said that this is a book with age the quote of thoreau is that when i read the bhagavad gita i feel as if all other literature that i have read is dwarfed into insignificance so every day i bathe myself in the gita's wisdom so aldous huxley said that this is a manifestation of perennial philosophy it's it's non sectarian spirituality perennial philosophy is that it is a book which gives us spiritual principles for living and of course some people consider it to be a holy religious text in india it is the book on which people in courts affirm that they will speak the truth something similar to what is done with the bible and or in quran and other parts of the world so this is also one view but i'll focus on one particular view of the gita and that is it is a book that provide it is a psychological handbook in fact mahatma gandhi whose anniversary was yesterday he said that i derive fresh meaning from the gita every day he says when i am i'm paraphrasing here when i see darkness all around and i find not a ray of hope on the horizon at that time i turn to the gita and i find myself smiling filled with hope even amid overwhelming despair so what is it about the gita that can infuse a person with such positivity purpose and so to understand that let's try to look at what the context of the gita is so we will look at the gita first at its context and then from there we will move to its content and its content will be covered from a psychological perspective over the course of the session now the gita is spoken on a battlefield and it begins with the warrior arjuna about to fight the most important war of his life this is a battle for which he has prepared throughout his life 
the entire epic mahabharat of which the gita is a part it is climaxing towards the particular war and if you consider this as the battlefield then arjuna's army is on this side so arjuna is there on the chariot with krishna who is acting as a chariot and he is part of the army called pandavas now these names are not very important for us or as far as the study of the gita from a psychological perspective is concerned but just to understand the context let's look at it and at the other side there is the army of the kauravas and arjuna is ready to fight at that time suddenly he has hesitation i think i should fight i should not fight what causes his hesitation is that there are his relatives even his venerable elders on the opposite side unfortunately this is a war between cousins and broadly speaking the pandavas are the good guys the kauravas are the bad guys but arjuna is such a good guy that he doesn't even want to hurt those who are the bad guys he wants so he comes in the middle of the battle and he is ready to fight suddenly he says hey i don't think i can fight now he is not simply overcome by a fear when he expresses reasons not even once does he express fear of his own death his fear is fear of the wrong choice of action is fighting the right thing to do but whatever it is the specifics of the ethics that cause him hesitation the point is that that arjuna who had raised his bow in readiness to fight suddenly puts aside his bow and he says i can't fight in fact if we consider the bhagavad gita the bhagavad gita has 18 chapters in it now at the start of the second chapter arjuna is in tears he is telling that i can't even hold my bow it's slipping my limbs are quivering i can't think clearly i am overwhelmed no if we look at the description of what arjuna is going through it seems very similar to what we could call today as a breakdown a emotional breakdown a mental breakdown more specifically arjuna has what is a ethical breakdown but nonetheless it's a breakdown that he has and he cast a sign is for i can't fight i can't fight but by the end of the gita arjuna has raised his bow again and he is saying that my doubts are dissipated my mind my mind is calm and i am ready to do what it takes what i am required to do while the gita can be understood at many levels the literal the non literal the ethical the metaphysical the specifically arjuna's bow it can represent our determination our basically our inner state our determination enthusiasm confidence whatever word you want is our inner state so face we, none of us will probably have to face a war few of us will if any at all but we all have to fight against various adversity is in life we may not we have to life is a battle but in the battle of life we may not have enemies but we have adversities we have difficulties that come upon us we have to fight and sometimes we have adversaries means both of them we need to fight against them. so in this battle of life the fighting may not be with bows and arrows but we need a fighting spirit we need determination and if that is not there then we won't be able to function so the gita restores arjuna's inner state to confidence to conviction to energy and at one level the gita is not a very large book the gita has 700 verses which can be recited for those who are fluent in sanskrit in about an hour 
at the most a couple of hours. The total number of text in the Gita itself is, it can be fit in the first and the last pages of the New York Times combined. So it's that much text, but that completely transforms Arjuna. That same Arjuna who is disheartened, who is confused, who is paralyzed, that Arjuna becomes determined. That Arjuna becomes confident. He becomes clear-headed. So we could say that for all of us, the Gita is meant to activate our inner Arjuna. There is something inside us which can get disheartened and which can be awakened, which can be activated. So the Gita is many things to many people, but it is definitely a guide for mind management. And that is what it does for Arjuna. So with this contextualization of what, how the Gita is relevant, let's now see how we can bring these two things together. We discussed the importance of the tapping the power of the mind. And now we discussed how the Gita's wisdom helped Arjuna tap the power of the mind. The mind was working so much against him that this warrior literally put his bow aside. I can't fight, he said. But by the end of the Gita, he raised his bow in readiness to fight. So what does the Gita say about the mind? In this, I'll talk about three broad things and <clears throat> all these three things are what we'll be elaborating on in future. So the Gita offers a three-level model of the self. If you consider the self, the self has three broad levels. There is the soul, There is the body. And in between them, there is the mind. So this three level can be compared with a computer system where there's the hardware, the software, and the user. So these three levels combined comprise the self. Atma, Mana, and Sharira. Now, within this, how essentially it works is that from the soul, let's put this separately to understand this a little better. So, uh, there's the body. Now, so, this is the soul, this is the body. Now, from the soul, the light of awareness comes out. We could say this is the light of awareness, this is Consciousness. So from the soul, the light of awareness is coming out. That is consciousness. This is consciousness, which is in Sanskrit called as Chetana. Now in the it's unclear, but I deliberately use yellow because it indicates light. So the idea is the soul is like a flashlight. Now, in a flashlight, if I have a flashlight, then there is one particular point from which light is coming out. And then light goes as a beam. So the soul is like the flashlight and consciousness is like the beam of light. It's a beam of energy. So through consciousness, broadly, we do two things. Through consciousness, there is, there is awareness and there is action. Now, of course, in between this, there is also analysis. And these three functions we'll be discussing about a little later. What it means is awareness means through consciousness, information comes in from outside. And then this information is processed inside. And then after that, action happens. So for example, right now, you are hearing. So you are, when you are hearing this talk and watching what is being depicted, the information is coming in. 
when the information is coming in, it's actually being taken in by consciousness. And when it is taken in, then it is being processed. Hey, this makes sense. This sounds interesting. This is a little complicated. No, all this is familiar to me. When will I learn something? There may be many different thoughts that will be coming. All that is the analysis that is happening. And then based on that, action comes. Okay. Hey. Yeah, I, this thing, I want to pay more attention to this. I have the things to do. When will this get over? Okay, where can I read more about this? So there's so many things that you want to do at a cognitive level or even at a practical level. So now in this process, in this link between consciousness and body, actually that link is established through the mind. So consciousness flows through the body through the, through the mind to the body. Let's put it another way, simply enough. Just making it longer for analysis sake. Hmm. So here there's the soul, mind, body. Now the soul is the root of consciousness. And the mind is the route of consciousness. Channel through which consciousness comes to the world physically. And now, what is important is that for us to function, just as our body needs to be fit, if my body is not healthy, my body is not fit, then I can't walk, maybe I can't talk, I can't lift weights. So, a fit body enables us to function. Similarly, we need the mind to be fit to function. And when you say the mind is not fit, what essentially does it mean? It means say, this is the soul. This is the body here. Now the mind, unfortunately, is off over here. And then the consciousness gets split. So the consciousness coming from the soul Part of it is going over here and say part of it is coming over here. This is when we get distracted. And say, right, say we are talking with someone. Maybe it's an important meeting, but our mind wanders off. What does that mean? That means our mind is not linking us properly with the body. Rather, the mind is linking us with something else. And depending on how much we wander off, it could be that. Here, I'm showing you 50% of the consciousness going to the mind, 50% to the body. But it could be 100% goes off to the mind. And if that happens, then that is what we call as absent-minded. Now, being absent-minded can just be annoying or sometimes humorous when people are absent-minded. But when the mind, mind is absent regularly, when we say, what, what does the mind is absent means? The mind is not there where the body is. The mind has gone off somewhere else. At that time, it can be distracting, but it can be far worse if it, it starts happening regularly. If it's something which we just can't control. If we, if we start uh, getting so habituated to it that our mind is just not able to focus, then that is when we start facing serious problems. So now, not only can the mind consume this consciousness by distracting it, that same mind can also become the cause of negative emotions. So that is when we start feeling that something inside us is opposing us. So when I talk about depression, the mind becomes bereft of all energy. The body may have energy, the mind is bereft of energy. Or the mind starts blocking all our energy and then we can't function. So, in this way, to some extent, a fit mind, for making our mind fit, essentially what we need to do is we need to get it back over here. We need to align the mind with the body. And for that purpose, we need to understand that I am not my mind. The mind is a part of me. It's an important part of me. 
what it is different from. And how can this alignment of the mind with the body be done? In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about two things. Abhyasa and Vairagya. And I'll explain these two terms in detail. There is practice and there is now the word technical, simple translation of the word Vairagya is detachment. But technique, but contextually this Vairagya refers to patience. When we are detached, that doesn't mean we don't care. Rather, we are patient. The mind can be like a child. And the child, if we want our child to grow up and become responsible, we can't expect a child who is two-year-old to start behaving like a 10-year-old or a 20-year-old in a few days. It'll take time. But during that time, we have to be kind, we have to be firm, we have to be intelligent in dealing with the child. So practice and patience. Now, what practice to do, how exactly to exercise this patience, that is what we'll be discussing in future sessions. And now, how are we going to go about our journey in this course? This first session is largely an introductory session. So how are we going to go about in this course is broadly, we're going to talk about first is understanding the mind. So if you consider the broad course, the first part of it is involving understand the mind. So here we will discuss the inner mechanism more in detail. I talked about the mind getting misaligned. How does the mind get misaligned? What gives energy to the mind? What exactly is the mind in itself? So we will be understanding the mind. Now, while for an overview purposes, these sessions are being distinct, but they are also going to involve application throughout. Uh, we'll discuss some practical applications of the insights, but there's going to be a focus for each of these sessions. So understanding the mind is the first part. There we'll discuss about what is the difference between the mind and the spirit. Uh, how much are we meant to work on the mind and change the mind? Or are we to work with the mind, accepting it for what it is? Then do we even have free will to change our mind? Free will can be a philosophical paradox, but can be also a practical necessity. And then we'll talk about the subjectivity and objective reality, how we all have conditionings and biases and how do we deal with them? Then the second part, each of these will be six sessions. We'll be applying this to deal with the mind. So while the men mental health challenges will be addressed briefly in the first half, in the second half, we'll be discussing about fear, fear, anxiety, worry, insecurity. What causes this? We'll talk about four principles by which fear can be managed. Fear can become a source of energy rather than a cause of paralysis for us. Then we'll be discussing about depression, which I mentioned. Then we also look at anger, addiction, and distraction. And all of these we'll be discussing from a very analytical as well as practical perspective. So lastly, we'll talk about in general. You say, I don't have any of these issues, but we all have our mind with our moods. And we can, if we could become more steady, more focused, everybody can say, okay, that we all can agree that we all can improve our focus. So how can we do that? That we'll be discussing. And the last part will be, we'll be discussing about mind and relationships. Few things can promise us, apart from our own mind in the outer world, few things can promise us as much happiness as a good relationship. And few things can cause us as much distress and heartbreak as a bad relationship. So we'll talk about what role the mind plays in our relationships. So how the mind, if we don't learn to manage our mind, we can end up wrecking even the best of relationships. Then, after that, we'll talk about how there is 
some people are optimistic some people are pessimistic there are all these binaries and how, while they are realities we don't have to be stuck with them we can accept them and also transcend them and we'll talk about uh, more about biases nowadays the world is becoming so polarized the people living in their own silos echo chambers conservatives liberals secularists religionists uh, people right wing left wing so why why do we think the way we do what causes our opinions and biases and orientations and default behaviors and how can we change those then we'll talk about love love is a central element in life a sent key key factor in relationships and it is the deepest longing of the heart so what is the nature of love and how can love be a source of fulfillment and not a cause of anxiety and uh, heartache for us uh, to enter the conclusion we'll be focusing on two things one is gratitude one of the most accessible and empowering ways to tap the power of the mind is to cultivate cultivate gratitude and how all the knowledge that we discussed before can help us develop the gratitude and where gratitude is not just a matter of uh, it's the emotion that we feel gratitude can be a decision it can be uh, arising naturally from a world view uh, that we'll discuss toward the end and last part we'll talk about meaning and purpose uh, the best the best way to not just feel good about where we are in our life we can feel good about where we are through gratitude but through meaning and purpose we can move ahead to actually do good to unleash our potentials and fulfill our destiny be what we are meant to be and contribute to not just making ourselves better but helping make our corner of the world better so i'll summarize i discuss broadly three points today the first was i discussed about the need to tap power tap the power of the mind so the first was we discuss power of mind in two ways the first was through negative examples i talked about depression addiction and suicide and through positive examples i talked about being in the zone and having peak performance where our mind seems to work with us then i talked about gita and mind where arjuna was overpowered essentially by his mind he could fight when he was expected to and the gita calmed him and restored him to clarity and conviction so for us in our battles against adversities and adversaries even if those are not physical battles our mind can sometimes obstruct us just as the gita can fill arjuna with hope so we will study the gita from a psychological perspective while there are many other perspectives also we we'll see how the gita can fill us with positivity purpose and energy and the last part was we talked about some gita insights so specifically the three level existence body mind and soul like the hardware software user and mental health challenges essentially as essentially arising from the misalignment of the mind with the body the consciousness gets split consciousness is the energy of the soul coming out from there gets split between the mind and the body and that is the root cause of various mental health challenges and the way is to align realign them is to practice and patience and what that means and how we can apply that that we'll be discussing in our future sessions so are there any questions or comments at this point yes nikhil hari krishna prabhu Two yes, two questions came up, Prabhu. Um, the first, uh, I'll just give the one, and then you can move on to someone else. Um, the first question I had was: Is every voice of our consciousness that we hear is that of the mind, or is it? Can it also be of pure consciousness or the self? In other words, where, like, does the where does the intelligence fit in your three in the three uh, three levels in that model? Okay, so where is the intelligence in the three-level model? Yes. Yes. And so, two things over there. See, uh, education 
sometimes involves simplifying the complex and sometimes it involves complicating the simple. That means sometimes when we are trying to explain some things, we say we start math. At that time, we focus on some simple principles. You cannot subtract larger numbers from smaller numbers. But over a period of time, we move forward and then after that, we teach other things also. So right now, we are focusing on a in the introduction, we are focusing on a minimalist model. In the minimalist model, we are simply talking about a three-level reality. Just like in computer, a software, hardware, and user. Now, within the software itself, we could have the some hard some in the software other. We can have something like viruses. So that that software actually though that is also software. But that, what it does is, it works against the device. So if I consider, if I have a computer system and I have the user at one end, I have the software and the hardware. Now in the software, we could have useful software and we could have harmful software. So we could have antivirus programs, we could have virus, uh, we could have viruses. So within the layer of the mind, there are multiple things. So within the mind, there are harmful programs. There are conditionings which are there. So the, in, in the subtle body, which can be in shorthand referred to as the mind, there are other components also. There is the intelligence also. So the intelligence would be like the would be like the antivirus programs, the, the protect, protective programs, the constructive programs. So yes, it is. So the mind can refer to this broad link. But as we zoom into it, we'll see that the mind has many components to it. There is a, there is a positive side of the mind. There's simply the functional side of the mind. There's a negative side of the mind. So the intelligence is more of the creative side. Understood, Bruce. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Prahlad. I think you need to be unmuted. Yeah, sorry. So I have a few questions. Uh, so first thing is, you know, the mind forces us uh, to do things that only the mind likes, right? So there are certain things that uh, we like and certain things that we hate, right? But some of the things that we hate are really important and we need to do, do those things, right? So is it like we can we program our mind to be happy in all the state like um, most of the time or uh, all the time or can we neutralize it uh, in a manner that you know we can get the get uh, our work done so that you know okay. it's yeah so i mean you got the question right yeah. Yeah. yeah i got the question so we could look at this we consider the two venn diagrams hmm? so this is Things that are good for us. Things good for us. And here the things that feel good for the mind. So let's consider this with respect to food. There, are, there is healthy food and there is tasty food. Now, if these two circles were identical, if all the healthy food was tasty and all the tasty food was healthy, life would be so easy. But it's not. Now that does not mean that no healthy food can be tasty. There are areas where there are intersections. So in general, the same applies to our mind. We need to find this area of intersection and focus on that. So this is where what the Gita calls us the Swabhava. And our mind has a particular orientation. And when we learn to work according to that orientation, there are some things that naturally interest us. Some people are interested in art, some people are interested in design, some people are interested in language, some people are interested in music, some people are interested in people specific. So, so what happens is, if our major life work is broadly in the area of the natural interest of the mind, then it is relatively easy to function. That does not mean even then, everything that we do is something which the mind will like. No, even say, even now I, I, one of my services is writing. 
I, I love words. I love to spend time with words. But it's not that doesn't mean that I will like writing all the time. There are times when ideas don't come through. There are times when I'm not satisfied with the way I've articulated myself. So even when we are doing something we like, that doesn't mean we'll always like. It. So as a matter of discipline, we need to be able to go against our mind. But if that is all that we are doing all the time, then we will feel exhausted. So we could put it this way: the art of inner balance. There are activities that are good, are good, feel good, and there are activities. are good and feel terrible you just don't like to do that so for us to balance ourselves we need to be able to find out a right balance we do these activities sufficiently that these will give us strength and these will take our strength so we need to find the inner balance that we are doing activities that give us strength your strength means they're naturally easy for us to do because our mind likes to do them and then we can do the activities which require strength which require us to go against our mind so this is the way we function right now but while we are doing this especially if we are practicing yoga and spirituality we can also change the tastes of the mind that means this circle can move this way as we grow more and more what will happen is these two circles will become more and more intersecting the intersection between them will increase more and more and the, the more the alignment between the two of these the easier it life will be the more we'll be in a contented state will the two align entirely maybe not but that's not necessary as long as we learn to have enough activities that give us strength we will be able to manage the activities that require strength without feeling too exhausted or depleted so we go there slowly yes slowly shanai shanai gradually yes okay thank you yes shrivachana you want to make some comments or ask something uh thank you prabhu this was a very uh, enlightening session uh, i had one question but uh, before that uh, uh, there's one question in the chat about where does intelligence come in uh, I, i think, think we covered that. that okay okay thank you so um uh, prabhu i was wondering uh, how how do we make our mind more aligned with the body is, is that what focusing means just to bring the mind more in alignment with uh, the body with the present moment and then is that what will lead to a focused state of mind and thus uh, arise well, that, that's one part of it at a basic level we if we are not living in the present so when we say live in the present that is important because it is in the present that we are experiencing life primarily so if we are talking with someone if we are doing some activity even if we are watching some if we go to a natural site and we are watching some beautiful scenery to experience the beauty our mind has to be where our body is hmm? so in that sense this alignment is important but how that alignment alone is not enough because we want to live in the present <laughs> but we also want to live for something bigger than the present sometimes the present may just be miserable if a patient is sick and in constant pain you tell the patient live in the present hey my present is unbearable and they live for something bigger than the present i want to recover i want to do this i want to do that so we live for we live in the present in the sense that the patient also has to live for take the medicines properly make sure that they are describing noticing and describing the whatever symptoms they have so that they can be treated but then we have to live for something bigger in the present so after the body mind and soul are aligned together 
what are they aligned for? What is the purpose of that alignment? That has to be properly understood and internalized. That is when we will be able to find contentment. So there, is, there are two things. Living in the pre pre present brings attention. Let's live in the present. But attention is not enough. We want satisfaction. And for that, we need to align these and live for something bigger than the present. So that is the next, that is also an important stage we'll be discussing in our talks. About what is the purpose that is, and how that can help us to move towards fulfillment. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Simply beautiful. Yes. Thank you, Sadhika. Yeah, Prabhu. Prabhu, I have a yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this topic, right? The living present, right? We we try to be, you know, living present most of the times, but you know, you get a lot of thoughts, right? Oh, I have to do this tomorrow. I have to do this. You know, did I do this one? Did I do that one? So we get keep coming that those thoughts, right? So how do we keep that? Is it only the the way we do prioritization, right? Like, okay, this is what our top priority, and uh, and then put focus on the top priority items or uh, because I usually write, for example, um, we get a lot of thoughts. It's, it's, it's a mind, right? When we yeah, get thoughts. Two. So, so when two we, things we, about it. Yeah, we may get yeah. bad thoughts, we make good thoughts, but we, we will ignore bad thoughts. We will focus on good thoughts, right? So we'll just uh, work on that. Is that the right way to do or anything? Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean, as you so mentioned, the, mind, the activities. The mind is basically, yes, yeah. The mind is basically like a thought generating machine. Mm -hmm. And it is for us, see, uh, it is for us to decide which thoughts we are going to focus on. So we'll be discussing much more when we talk about distraction, we'll be talking much more about this. But essentially, the word thought has two meanings. Say, for example, I say, I just got a thought. Here, we are talking about a thought as like a bubble that rose within us, like a pop up on our device. But if I say, I have given this a lot of thought, what does this mean? This means I have paid conscious attention to this. So we have this capacity to choose which thoughts deserve our thought. And for that, we need to be able to distance ourselves. So what you do writing, if thoughts thought just come in the mind and you start doing them, at that time, there is not enough time to process. But if you write things down, uh, sometimes journaling is very helpful. Meditation also helps us to create a distance between us and our thoughts. So if somebody is very hooked to their device, every notification that comes up, they'll start clicking it. They will go mad because they can't function. So many notifications will come up. They put aside their device or something. It's calm. Sit down. And which, what is real? What am I using this phone for? What is really important? Focus on that. So basically, a time for disconnection with the mind and its continuous thoughts. So that, that means is ignoring. What we all so that means ignoring, Prabhu. Is that something? Can I understand that way? Yeah, ignoring is a very strong word. Mm -hmm. Ignoring is true, mm -hmm. but the but the idea is more of free focus. Okay. Sometimes when we try to ignore something, like we are ignoring some person. That person wants to talk with us, but we don't want to talk with them. We are in a party or a get together. So we are yeah. very much aware of that person and we yeah. are moving away from that person. So I would say ignoring involves also paying certain level of attention. It's more of refocusing, reminding uh -huh. ourselves of what is important and focusing on that. And then ignoring it happens as a byproduct of refocusing. Right, right. So that means automatically the, the, the ignoring is happening by default because when you're focusing... Yeah, just like a note now, sometimes the notification comes up. If you don't pay attention to the notification, it just goes away after some time. Okay. Or other notifications come up. So like that. Yeah. So refocusing primarily. And for us to so we need to re reconnect ourselves with mm -hmm. the things that are important for us regularly. That's why regular study of the Bhagavad Gita, regular study of wisdom texts like this, regular meditation, regular introspection breaks, they can help us to uh, connect with the things that matter for us. And then we will know what to focus on and by that, what to circumstantially or as tang or tangentially neglect okay that means the byproduct is anyway it's ignoring right ignoring those items byproduct is that 
when you are focusing on the the right things yeah. uh, more and more so yeah yes yes that is true yes thank you Yeah, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Just your nurse with us. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I I was wondering in this model of uh, soul, body, mind, consciousness, w- 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 desire is is desire the function of soul or the body or the mind? Uh, where where does the desire fit in in this model? Okay. Basically, desire like thought comes from two different sources. say the desire if i consider the soul mm, to be conscious is to be desirous when we are conscious of anything we will like some things we won't like some things so to be conscious is to be desirous so the faculty for desiring the faculty for desiring comes from the soul now the specific desires that we may have they can come from a combination of the mind body specific desires they can come from different sources so we need to look at those sources for the desires the, the at the spiritual level each one of us is pure but sometimes we may get angry with someone and we want to attack someone we want to destroy someone but that desire that anger that is not coming from the soul that is coming from the conditioning of the mind the perception of the body so desiring faculty comes from the soul specific desires come from what is external to the soul now in a very pure state the soul's natural desiring faculty and its natural desires can also be awakened so right now some traditions for example say we just should give up all desires that just become nirasha now give become free from all asha desire well there is some truth to that because most of the desires that come from the body mind machine can be disruptive and can even be destructive at times however it is not that all desire is to be given up because desiring is natural to the soul and we all have healthy desires also positive desires desires to do good and those can be nourished okay yes thank you uh, i have thank you. yes sarita ji there any mala do you have a question sarita ji yes tapoma i'm sorry i was and mute and talking okay my okay. question why the mind is all of sudden do some of the people are facing some mental health issues right all of sudden they loses they lose the uh, mind power or else uh, some ki- kind of capacity to understand listen and uh, in, uh, react so example it happens to uh, any one of us sometimes while we are typing we cannot listen or else while listening we cannot type so that kind of capability uh, why uh, some people will still though they grow old, older but still they confuse between the left and right right of them uh, why they will can have why the mind will have this type of, this type of uh, behavior okay see two things are there this is something which we will be discussing later on that the mind and the body these are material things and they are resources so each one of us has this this is like a vehicle for us it like a you can consider it to be a vehicle it can consider it to be like a residence whichever we want to look at it but either way each one of us has it different and why why is it different for each one of us it is the gita, gita explains it's based on our past actions those actions could be from this particular phase of our life it could be from a, from a previous phase of our life from a previous life also so this is where karma destiny and all those things come in but essentially the mind and the body are resources that we have been given based on our past and because we all have different past so we naturally have different resources coming from the past and even within the resources that we have been given 
just like different people, their body health varies. Sometimes some people may just suddenly develop some back pain. Now, at a basic level, it's a different people have different bodily abilities. Some people may be very skillful in terms of their bodily movement. They can dance, they can move in a very aesthetically pleasing way. Some people can't. That's just the way their body is. So like that, there are different, different minds have different abilities. I think different bodies have different abilities. And just as the body can go through different phases in its health, sometimes it can get injured and we know a particular cause for the injury. And we deal with that. Sometimes we suddenly start feeling back pain and there are so many biology problems for which doctors say, we just don't know the cause, but we'll try to deal with it. So the mind can also be like that. Sometimes we can't find out, okay, why is this... Uh, why am I getting so distracted? Why am I feeling so restless? Why am I ha having this craving? Sometimes we find it and we address it. Sometimes even if we can't find the cause, we can address it. So the focus is always on that this is a tool and I have to make the best use of the tool. And the specific changes in the capabilities of the, the capabilities of the tool, to the extent we can understand their causes, that is fine. But otherwise, we can learn to adapt ourselves to both work with those changes and work on those changes. It's like if our car suddenly starts uh, emitting a too much noise. Well, we'll try to go to a mechanic and we'll try to fix it. At the same time, we keep using the car. So we have to work with them. So mind management involves these two things. Both. We work with the mind. That means this is the, this is the way my mind functions right now. That's okay. Some people are naturally more uh, pessimist, naturally optimistic. Some people are more pessimistic. Well, this is the way my mind is, I can work there. So somebody is more pessimistic, those who see faults. You know, though they can find themselves in professions where fault finding is actually essential. They can become editors, they can become quality control in charges. So we work with the mind. But then we also work on the mind. Just because I can see faults doesn't mean I have to tell faults to everyone all the time. There's a time and this is a, this is a skill which is useful, a time and skill is not useful. So mind management involves both these things. Thank you. Yes, the poem. Yes, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh, Prabhu, I love the analogy you drew of how the uh, mind interacts with the body through consciousness and the, like the analogy of the torch beam. And uh, that, uh, that got me thinking, uh, you know, uh, then what about the battery of the torch? Like, um, uh, you know, what, what's the source of the energy that drives that, you know, beaming okay. of the consciousness? And like, how does it compare to our, you know, Newtonian understanding of energy, like the material energy? Okay, good question. So the soul itself, one of its characteristics is Sat. We'll discuss more about the character of the soul also. Sat means its existence or more of enduring or eternal existence. The soul's consciousness is innate to it. It does not require any replenishing. So this is almost like a, like a perpetual motion machine, which is more hypothetical than real. But the soul is like a perpetual consciousness source. It's innate to the soul. So that does not require a replenishing. However, what does require replenishing is the direction in which the consciousness is going. Say, for example, if I have a flashlight and I carry the flashlight. Now, if I'm going through a very dark area for hours together, my hand will get weaker and weaker. The flashlight is giving the same light, but maybe my hand gets aligned, it starts falling down. Then I can't see ahead because the lamp light, the flashlight light is going downward, downward. So we want you to see properly ahead. If there is some danger above us, you want to see above what's in the roof or what's in the sky. You want to see it. So like that, we need replenishment at the level of the body and the mind uh, so that the consciousness can be directed where we want it to be directed. And when we say spiritual re re replenishment also, there is that, so there are spiritual practices which nourish us, which replenish us. So they, it's not that they, they make the consciousness stronger. Consciousness is always there coming from the soul. 
but they make the direction of the consciousness wiser. That without that replenishment, consciousness will go off in unhealthy directions. With the replenishment of consciousness, consciousness will go in healthy directions. Does that answer your question? Yes, Prabhu, got it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Yes, we will have one or, one or two questions and then we'll stop. Yes, Arvind? Arvind, are you there? Yeah. yeah Bro, you were talking about uh, in the zone state of the mind. So uh, yes. sometimes we decide to do something. We we, uh, we decide a goal and we try to follow it rigorously. And uh, we sometimes be in the zone. And suddenly after a few days or few weeks, uh, we lack the interest and we go out of the zone only. We don't get interest from the completely distracted. So. Uh, why the mind does like this? The same mind which have decided to focus on something, the same mind distracts us completely. Yeah. So that's my mm. question. Okay. So, so the nature of the mind is that it is fickle. We will be discussing various metaphors for understanding the mind in our future sessions. So one very helpful metaphor is to consider the mind to be like a child. In the Bhagavad Gita, the word used to describe the mind is chanchala. Chanchala means restless. That is just the nature of the mind. It gets excited about something, it stays excited for some time, and then it loses interest. That is why we cannot let our life be determined or be dependent on the mind alone. There are higher interests, higher things that are important for us. So, when we understand the nature of the mind, okay, today it's interested, tomorrow it will not. Then what we will be able to do is, okay, why do I feel so excited about it? Why do I feel this is so important? Write it down. Okay. So write it down and write it down in not just an informational way, but in more of a way that involves our emotion, that involves our entire being. And then revisit that. So when the mind feels down, okay. when the mind is not giving us energy, then we have to get energy from somewhere else. And that way we can maintain our motivation. We'll be talking later about the concept called modes. This is a very important part of the Bhagavad Gita. It's called gunas or modes. These are subtle psychological forces that shape the way we function. And these modes are often the cause of our moods and our moodiness. So we will discuss this. But essentially, just at this stage, just understanding the mind is restless. So it will lose interest. That's just the way it is. So we, just like I said, the, if I'm carrying a flash for life for a long time, the flash will get lower as my hand becomes weak. So what do I do? I eat food and I have strength and then I can point the flashlight straight ahead. So like that, we anticipate that the mind is going to lose interest and then we prepare accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tobi. Thank you everyone for your participation. And our next session, we will be discussing uh, specifically about from mental health to spiritual health. We will discuss about mindfulness, meditation, yoga. What, uh, why are they becoming so popular today? What is, uh, what is spirituality? Actually? How is it related with mental health? And how we can combine both spiritual insights and mental insights for improving ourselves. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna.